Welcome to season four of the Ubuntu UK podcast, episode two. It's Tuesday, the 15th of March, 2010, and in this episode, we're going to talk about non-free software in Ubuntu by default, and Richard Stallman's rock concerts around the UK. We'll also cover the latest news, events, bit about Ubuntu, command line love, and go over your feedback. With me this week are Tony and Mark, who's feverishly beavering away on the website to fix something. Uh, so yeah, let's go to Tony. How Hello. You doing, Tony? Not too bad, mate. How are you? Yeah, not bad. No. A good, bit good. stressed, but yeah. Well, yeah, it's the thrill of doing this live that yeah, just being, adds... Being able to read. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Some life skills that you can only learn when you're doing the Ubuntu UK podcast, I guess. Yes. What have you um, been up to then? A couple of things. I've been working on some of the, the extra little bits of software that we use for doing this show. I started a, a dodgy shell script to play in the music stings, and I've been right. working on it over the last week or so, and it's quite cool now. I like it. Uh, a shell script? Shell scripts make So it just happy, plays actually. audio files? Yes, but it's very clever. And if you want to go to uh, um, my website and check it out, you can do. We'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, let's, let's do that. And I also get interviewed for Computing Magazine, that trade rag that comes around free every, uh, every week or so to... Um, uh, computing IT people yeah. um, talking about cloud security services. Mm. Yeah, Interviewed on audio, video? Uh, video. They brought a little video camera down and videoed me. And uh, it's as live, so it'll go out as if it was live on uh, on Friday, I think. Ah, but we'll all know you're faking it. Yeah, so keep right. that a secret, please, everybody. Okay. Well, super. Excellent. Mark, have you Hello, finished, have you finished I'm back. It's all good. Fixing the website. Yes. <laughs> Marvellous. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. What have you been up to? Um, I've been uh, learning to use and using Vim. I suddenly decided Why? to do that. Why? After, after all of my, uh, my programming years, I suddenly decided it would be worth actually working out what Vim's all about and why the people who use it rave about it and why the people who don't use it hate it. Have you printed out a Vi cheat sheet? I've had one of those on my desk for about a year just because there's always the odd situation where I'm stuck using it. It's but got now, co- coffee stains in it. Yeah. But now I've actually started using it, I can understand why people do. Oh. So very, very clever and very efficient. I, th- I feel exactly the same way. I see my coworkers using it and mashing the keys and doing things very advanced. And I'm there in nano feeling yeah, exactly. somewhat inadequate. Because a text editor shouldn't need a manual. Well, yeah. Maybe. It doesn't need a manual. You just need to remember all the commands. I tell you what, if you've ever played NetHack. Here we go. Then uh, <laughs> if you ever play NetHack, it really helps you learn Vim. So if you're going to try and learn Vim, learn to play NetHack first and you're halfway there. Okay. Strange logic. Okay. Uh, now that voice yeah. is not our, our <laughs> usual Laura. Uh, our usual Laura is away today. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a new Laura in to replace her. <laughs> <laughs> Substitute Laura. <laughs> yes, uh, replacement Thanks. Laura. And it's uh, Laura Tchaikovsky. How are you? Not too bad. Thank you very much. Good, good. So um, for people who don't know you, um, who are you and what do you do? Um, well, I'm Tchaikovsky on IRC, but I'm the person who used to ring in here and Skype and leave random messages about events that I was running in Ireland. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Yeah. As if you couldn't tell from the accent, Laura yes. happens to be from Ireland. I do indeed, but we- I moved over here four months ago for a job. So I'm over here now full time. Excellent. And, and you do- work for an uh, IT company that does open source stuff, don't you? I do. I work for Sirius down in Weybridge. Um, mm-hmm. So we're an open source company and my job then I work in is marketing. Cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's pretty interesting. So I get to organise and attend events. And um, yeah, one of our big things at the moment is that opening up our company for um, user groups to come and take part in use the building and um so the surrey log group is one that, that use it at the moment yeah they come along um like once a month or something like that yeah they? once a month so we rotated between us red hat and nokia and um so once a month they come they use the building gave talks there on saturday and then did uh, demonstrations and installations of thin clients cool yeah. so what are your sort of interests in ubuntu what things do you get involved in yeah i'm a community person Okay. Yes. <laughs> that mean, just gets her out of answering any questions. <laughs> just giving your opinion whether anybody likes it or not. Just yeah. blogging. Yeah. 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 I blog, I tweet, I dent, and I mostly am involved in local teams and the local council, like Poopy is. And you also ran the OS Bar Camp event that we did a couple of um, yeah. shows from oh, in yes. the last couple of years. Yes, yeah, yeah. so I ran four of them back home in Ireland, and hopefully they haven't just died because I've left Ireland, but hopefully <laughs> they will get back to life again. <laughs> so, what about you, Alan? What have you been up to? I edited a video using Linux, oh, hey. and, and it didn't crash. I think oh. you're the first person ever to do that. I know. <laughs> I, know. I was actually amazed myself. I, I, what it was, was there's a, there's a TV show I watch, and there's a bit of incidental music in the TV show, and I couldn't remember where I knew the music from. And uh, I posted a link to iPlayer on some forum where they ask, you know, where did this music come from type forum. Oh, yeah. And the guy said, oh, I can't watch that because it's on iPlayer. Could you put it on YouTube? So I thought, actually, yeah, I probably can. So I cut the video down to just the 40 seconds that had the song in it using Pity V. Yep. Ex- exported it out as an AVI file, uploaded it to YouTube, and it just worked. And I was amazed. That's legal, right? 
brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. <laughs> right, we better get on with yeah, it. Yeah, let's get on with the show. <laughs> So recently, uh, an announcement was uh, sent around the UK, and uh, everyone stopped what they were doing uh, to read the announcement, which was that Richard Stallman was coming. Uh, and, uh, Lock up your daughters. <laughs> <laughs> Six minutes in, Mark. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, and uh, and he, he's done a tour of the UK. I think this, he's still here, uh, touring around, giving yes. talks. Uh, to various free software groups, and he's about uh, eight or nine cities. I think he's visiting, isn't he? Yeah, it? Um, and we kind of wondered: um, Is Richard Stallman still relevant? Okay, so us. for those of us who don't know who Richard Stallman is, he, he says, started the he Free Software Foundation and was instrumental in getting the GNU project up and running uh, by creating tools that were like Unix tools that were non-free. So he created a bunch of free tools like Emacs that I think he still maintains and a bunch of other tools. Um, so most of the people who are using Linux these days are using Linux kernel plus GNU tools that he helped uh, build and is still a keen advocate of today. And he started writing the first compiler for open source, you know, GNU compilers, GCC, and all that mm. sort of stuff, and built oh. a lot of the fundamental kind of system tools. Wrote the GPL as well. And I think he point. had a hand. I don't think he fully wrote it himself. Oh, right. I think people, uh, Bruce Perens and uh, a few others had a hand in that as well. But he also helped set up the Free Software Foundation, yeah. um, which obviously looks after the GPL and, and has a lot of the software that was originally written for the GNU project under its kind of wing to look after and promote and make sure nobody starts to steal it. And they still have some sort of campaigning um, wing mm -hmm. as well, don't they? Sort of making sure that the message about free software gets out there. But that said, um, there's also quite a bit of sort of scepticism about uh, Richard Stallman's role, RMS, as he likes to be known, um, in the modern free software world or open source world, as if, uh, if you like. Because he's very much of the old guard, isn't he? Well, yeah. I mean, he, he's staunchly stayed by his, his um, position which is no non-free software, you know, it, you should run free software, you shouldn't advocate the use of proprietary tools when free software is available to do the same job. Yes. Um, mm. And so, for example, he himself uses, you know, free software on his own computer, uh, right from the BIOS through to the machine itself. Um, but, but it does seem to me that he, the way he uses a computer seems, you know, somewhat retro. Um, and, mm. for example, you know, doesn't get his email via a graphical tool, sits there at a console all the time and only uses X to open PDFs or other images. Um, he, I, I feel he, he's, he's kind of not realised that everyone else has moved on a bit. Do you think, that's, do you think he doesn't realise, or, or do you think he realises and doesn't care that everybody's moved on? I, I just don't think he actually cares, to be honest. I mean, he's quite set and staunch in his ways, as Popey said. Um, I was, I was at the talk there in London and um, I found it quite interesting because I'd never actually seen him speak live and I was curious. I wanted to see what all the fuss was about. Um, but I just found him rather dismissive of people. Like, so he refers to the iPad as iPad, uh, the Kindle as the swindle. And I go, oh, seriously? There's it's a just lot of childish that. behaviour. Yeah. And if people made the mistake of saying open source software, he jumped down them like with a gun. Um, do you think he does the Microsoft thing with the dollar sign instead of the S? <laughs> <laughs> I just find that immature. People do it on IRC the whole time. Like, yeah, and it's just, you know cool. what? If you want to be treated with a bit of respect and grown up, then you know, cop on. Mm. I I kind of agree. With you. I, I I kind of agree with you in that I do feel those those kind of you know rebranding things as you know like the um, the iBad and and so on and the Tech Rights website, which also um, writes a lot about free software. They do the same kind of thing. They you know smush together words and chuck in a bad word to make it look you know, worse than it is. They do that with Microsoft and Attachmate and Novell and mm. Mono and all these kind of things. And it, it really detracts from the message that they're trying to get across. I, I would have a lot more respect for Richard Stallman and the Free Software Foundation if they didn't do that kind of stuff. Like the whole bad vista and um, when they tried to get people to do a denial of service attack on the Genius Bar in Apple stores, all that kind of stuff just makes me think, I'm never going to donate to you people. I don't sympathize with your cause. Because of the way you're presenting your cause, not the word, the, the underlying message is is you know is fair, mm. and I completely appreciate that. And yeah, I would love to have a free software machine, but the fact is, I don't. 
Well, the fact is, you don't, <laughs> I don't actually want to be associated with people who do those kind of things as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if I'm trying to explain to people about open source or free software or whatever, and if I use the word open source, I don't expect somebody to jump down my throat because I say the word free software. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I can see why he does it. Because linguistically, open source and free software are not the same. Yeah. They're, no, they're very different. They and, are. And, and you can see why he has a bee in his bonnet about always using the term free software, because it has a very specific meaning. Which is fine when you're talking to geeks and nerds who fully appreciate that, but to your everyday end user, they don't. And if you have somebody who's standing up there ranting and raving at them, it doesn't come across well. Yeah, and and I, I can appreciate that. And I, if I was talking to my mum, and I put I used the banner phrase "floss" or "free Libra open source," I mean, it would fly over her head. But if I sat and explained it to her, I still don't think she would get that fussed about the fact that there's open source and there's free software. It's all kind of community commons um, created or maintained stuff. What license is under? Okay, yeah, it's important, but it's not that important when you're talking between two individuals. Is it true that end users, you know, the wider, let's for our sake, say Ubuntu users, actually see Stallman and actually get to to, to see this, um, you know, poor PR face that he sometimes puts across, perhaps? Um, or is it really actually only the people who are interested in development of the operating system and the platform that, firstly, hear about what he's up to, and secondly, care one way or the other about it? Well, he, I mean, he does a lot. About, I mean, I've seen him sort of more publicly in the last year or so than I have done in the past because he's been doing things like writing for the Guardian website. Mm. Oh, okay. Um, he's done quite a few articles. Like he did um, he did the one about cloud computing with the whole careless computing thing. Mm. Oh, yeah, I remember that, yeah. Mm. And that's mainstream press. You don't yeah. get much more no, widely read. Absolutely. Than... And, you know, he's it's there talking about him as the head of the Free Software Foundation as well. Yeah. So, sorry. The, I... And you're right. There is the... the, the he is... Um, seen publicly but even then okay the guardian i haven't seen him on newsnight i haven't seen him on any mainstream tv at all in this country i'd be surprised if he's been on any mainstream tv in the u.s uh, i would think the columns he writes for the guardian are probably read mostly by geeks and mm. people who follow people like cory doctorow and you know the, those kind of people who are mm. there they're, there's a kind of community of people who are you know um, self -refer self referential and will read each other's work. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure that does permeate out to the rest of the planet. Isn't there a thing that as the free software or open source community has grown, we've actually got m enough people that people can specialise in one area? Like Laurie said, you know, you're a community kind of person rather than a developer or something like that. You know, there are actually people are able to carve their own little niches within the free software and open source community. Back in back in the early days, you had to be everything. You had to go out and evangelize and develop software and set up a company to support it and do all these things. Whereas, yeah, you know, okay, so so obviously you've got to respect the contributions that you made as a programmer and developer and you know, an undeniable massive contribution that sort of set the, the groundwork for what we have today. But 20 or 30 years on... Um, is he still the right person for the job? Is he still the right person to be going out and talking to people? Um, or, or are there better speakers, more inspirational speakers, yeah. people who can perhaps put their points across in a slightly more uh, easy to grasp way? Well, in, in the commercial world, if someone um, starts a company, they are, you know, if they, if, if they develop a product and they are the one person who's developed that product in their shed, they then employ PR people, they employ salespeople, they employ marketing people, they employ, mm. and they would probably recruit a new CEO. They would rec recruit people who are specialists in those areas. But I think the problem that Richard would have or that the FSF would have in trying to recruit the best of breed of all those areas is those people wouldn't have the same ideals. Mm. So there would be a conflict because no, I would find it difficult to find a CEO who was, you must say free software and not open source. You must say good news slash Linux and not Linux. I would, find it, I would find it incredulous that there would be people out there other than Richard Stallman and people in the FSF who believe that. But there'll be people who do it as if it was their job to do it, then they'd do it, surely. If, they, <laughs> if their job was to be the CEO of, you know, a free software company and part of that was to use the right terminology. I mean, people have to do that in, um, like, other sort of private mm. sector, I mean, public sector, whatever job they're in, you know, there's sort of acceptable language to use and unacceptable language to use. I don't think they'd get the job at the FSM. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think you're right. I think there are there is a um, 
a point at which we've the the rest of the planet has kind of moved on a bit and he's still you know yeah and there was a video i think we talked about it in last season um where uh, at a conference he'd sort of started you know picking his toes or something like that during a, an interview an on-stage interview yeah so so i mean he like many geeks he he has social interaction issues sure whether that be shouting at people because they're not talking to him in the right tone of voice or yeah. enunciating their he vowels did. <laughs> yep, he did it the whole oh, way through yeah. the london talk yeah so you know there are there are people out there who have social issues but you put those aside because they are brilliant programmers or they are great at marketing or they you know they, their sales pattern is fantastic yeah, exactly. But you shouldn't probably go up on stage and 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 try and effectively sell in quotes this software because it's perhaps not where your strengths are anymore. Perhaps, yeah. Or there are better people who can do it. Which is, I think, is you know, maybe he should finish Emacs. Go back and finish Emacs and or the herd. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, if he's if he's still, I don't know how how much development he still does these days. But if he's still got the you know the the, the skills of a developer, maybe he should go and you know lead and and perhaps look at some of the engineering levels and say finish the herd and stuff like that i mean not wanting to tell, tell him what he can and can't do because it's in a day it's his choice if people want to listen they will mm. listen but yeah, absolutely. i do i do worry about some of the uh yeah the I, I, it does this. make me cringe when i and i see yeah. the talks and i think oh people are going to associate me with him you know mm. and you know it's not that he's a bad man i just think no. he's the wrong man for that job yeah yeah I mean, we, we uh who's an alternative there you go <sighs> yeah <laughs> any, any suggestions yeah email us <laughs> I, don't, oh, yeah. I don't have any suggestions that's just it though unfortunately at present right now he is the only well, I don't, no I don't, I don't think that's the case I think there are other people out there there are people who are upcoming through the FSF I mean the FSF is not a tiny organisation no. there no. are people who work there I'm sure there are people who are very skilled and people who have like I'll tell you what who would be the person Benjamin Mako Hill oh yeah Benjamin's mm. great he yeah. would be the kind of person to take over from Richard Stallman, in my opinion. Yeah. Because he has the charisma to be able to command an audience and get them, you know, to listen to his message. And he can articulate himself well, and he doesn't eat his feet when he's <laughs> sat on a stage. Alan Bell suggests Eben Moglen as well as a very good a very yes. good public speaker. Yeah. And he also has an intimate knowledge of the legalities of licenses like the GPL. Basically, they were looking for someone who actually would draw in a crowd as well for those kind of talks because it is revenue for them as well. Mm. So. Yeah, that's fair enough. There was an article today where uh, uh, Richard Stallman was saying um, that cell phones are um, Stalin's latest tool or something like that, um, saying that he, he refuses to carry one because um, it can mean he can be tracked wherever he is in the world and uh, right. you know, uh, his data. Can yeah, be but some people don't accepted. care about that. They put all their stuff on Facebook. They're, yeah. they're, you know, so the, the problem, this is, this is where the problem of the disconnect comes up, is that there are you know, half a billion people out there who are on things like Facebook. There are also you know, millions, probably an overlap with those people, who have latitude turned on on their phone. And there are millions of people on the planet who have their email hosted by a cloud service. And apparently all these people are stupid, according to Richard Stallman. Mm. And I don't think that's the case. I don't think there are half a billion stupid people on the planet. <laughs> I just think they have different priorities than him. Yeah, it's not building bridges, is it? No. Sort of effectively, you know, kind of telling these people that they are stupid or whatever. Um, yeah, just quickly look at this. This Stalin um, uh, cell phones are Stalin's dream. It says um, this story um, talking about PCs, tablets, and anything else that might run Android or something like that. You know. Essentially, they're still tools of, of the man, if you like, of Big Brother and enable you to be uh, to be tracked. And if there's sort of, you know, non-free firmware or non-free kind of little bits in the operating system. Yeah, it's, it's, it's no all good. or nothing. You, you, can't, you can't have, you know, in, in his mind, you can't have any components that are non-free. Yeah. It has to be fully free. But then let's all take a step back 30 years and have... You know, two D graphics consoles. Yeah, it's, you know, well, yeah. No I mean, wireless. He does, he does say in that article, it's it's about whether you like the convenience mm -hmm. of using all the non free stuff, and most people do, and most yeah. people will live with that. Now, I don't have the firmware to the tumble dryer in my house, or the washing machine, or the microwave, or the oven, or any of the other devices that are in my house. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have the source code for no. any of that stuff, and. I don't really care because the fact is when I put my washing in the washing machine, I want it to come out clean. <laughs> I don't really care if the software in there is free or not. And I think that opinion is what most people have of computers. They want to turn it on, do a job, turn it off. Okay. And um, 
I, I think I agree. I think and there is a need for somebody to be at that far extreme, but I, I, I think there are probably better people to be going out into the uh, the world in general and uh, and taking that message out. Mm. There we go. Let us know what your opinions are. Email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. Okay, we're muted. And now it's time for the news. A group of Android developers have formed a union to pressurise Google into reforming its Android market policies. Among the group's demands are a renegotiation of Google's 32% cut from app sales and public bug tracking of the Android market system. The group's mailing list currently has 22 subscribers. How long has it been in action for? Um, I think a week or so. Okay. Since oh no, I think it was just after our last show I spotted it. So right. yeah, nearly two weeks. You think people are going to really care about this? Well, apparently, not more than twenty-two Android developers care that strongly. Fair enough. Brian Stevens of Red Hat has responded to recent news that new versions of the company's enterprise Linux distribution no longer ship with their kernel patches separate to the main kernel source. He confirmed rumours that this was done to thwart competitors, in inverted commas, by making specialist knowledge about these patches exclusive to Red Hat customers. Competitors there read Oracle. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but not CentOS, who apparently they're quite happy with. And But then to be fair, know. CentOS just recompile what Red Hat put out anyway. And don't so Red Hat have an upgrade shouldn't. path? If you've got CentOS, they're quite... I, I saw that they were quite happy to support you mm, while yeah. you've got I think, CentOS well, boxes. The, the thing that he was saying was that it's uh, aimed to make it harder for companies who come along and say, we'll support your Red Hat install, install yeah. for less than Red Hat will, basically. Right. The US Department of Justice has launched a formal investigation into MPEG LA after its rallying cry to patent holders who believe Google's WebM video format infringes on their patents. The DOJ is said to be investigating whether this was an intentional move by the MPEG LA to stunt growth of WebM by creating a legal uncertainty around the format. Good. Yeah. Good. Good old DOJ. Yes, I hope they give them a smack on the wrist. Although this does, I do, I do like this the fact that this raises the point that you can't claim that any codec is absolutely free Be- because there are so many companies behind yeah. the MPEG LA and there are so many other little companies out there who hold patterns mm. that it's entirely possible that OG, Theora, you know, WebM, Dirac, all of those are subject to this kind of deal. But I also like the fact that it shows that you can't just go around saying, oh, we probably own that, you shouldn't use it yes. just because some new free software crops up. Yeah, it's a racket. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Hewlett Packard announced plans to ship all of its desktops and laptops running its Linux-based WebOS along web windows. Um, this move sees that HP ensuring that 2012 will be the year of the Linux desktop. Yay! <laughs> Finally, it's here. So it's next year. Next year. It's no, it's not this year. current year that they said it was. Yeah, okay. Has yeah, anyone yeah, used yeah. WebOS? I've used someone else's phone. Yeah, I, I was going to get a Palm Pre, but then I got Android instead. Mm. They talk about putting in printers and every HP device basically is wow. going to be able to run WebOS servers as well. Well, p- yeah, presumably, wow. yeah. Hmm. Quite what you do with it on a server, but I don't know. But um, yeah, it's still Linux. Well, yes, exactly. Wow. Exactly. So that, you know, it could become basically the biggest shifter of Linux yeah. installs in the world. Probably be a good um, candidate for sort of instant on uh, as a sort of secondary thing on laptops as well. Yeah. Yeah, and desktops, I suppose. Just well, I think they'd probably argue it's thing. good as a primary OS as well. But. Well, we'll see how it goes, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> if anybody at HP would like to send us some free kit running WebOS, we'll give good. it a test. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Give yeah. us some feedback. Twitter has made an announcement discouraging developers from producing Twitter clients that mimic functionality of the official clients and website. The reasons cited include abuse of the Twitter API and breaches of users' privacy, as well as the desire to ensure a consistent user experience for the platform. Meaning you must show our adverts, Pretty basically. Much. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we've got a lovely public API, which really helps spur the growth of Twitter, and people could write their own clients, and you could integrate with pretty much anything in the world that had an IP stack, and now you're not going to be able to do that as much anymore. Mm. I think you will. You just have to ensure that you show the advert. I'm pretty sure that's what it's going to boil down to, is you're going to have to show the promoted tweets and the adverts. Yeah. I guess they need to make money, don't they? Yep. Yep. The ADA initiative, which supports the involvement of women in open technology and culture, has launched a census to find out which areas of the community women are working in and how they are affected by the culture of each area. We're going to put a link in the show notes if you want to take part in that. The survey is not just for women, it's also for guys. Yeah, I um, tried that. <laughs> right. It does ask you if you're male or female, and I thought, oh, I wonder if it will just drop me out if I say I'm male. But no, it does actually <laughs> ask you further questions. Yeah, if you're interested in filling that in, please check that out. Okay, we've got some events going on, and I'm going to ask Alan if he can read out the first of those events. The UK Loco are holding a meet-up this Saturday on the 19th of March to watch the England v Ireland rugby match. It's taking place at 4pm in the North Coat Pub in Clapham. You organised this, didn't you, Laura? I did. Fancy that. <laughs> I know, fancy that, me and rugby. So it's going to be the England supporters on one side and you on the other one? No, there's going to be a, a circle of Ubuntu people. Yeah. A circle of friends. Outside all the uh, England and Ireland supporters. Yeah. Going, what is this football thing? Yeah. Sounds like fun. Oh, Tuesday the 29th and Thursday, or Tuesday the 29th and Wednesday the 30th of March, Open Source Junction two-day workshop to show delegates uh, how to manage the production of cross-platform mobile apps in the open development context. Oh, I'm going to that. Are we? Yes. Really? What is it? It's uh, so uh, there, it, it's being run by um, a group called Ostwatch, who do sort of open source advisory for oh, education, yeah. and uh, it's basically a sort of development workshop for um, open source and cross platform mobile development. Cool, excellent. And we've got the uh, promo for the UCube event at Mad Lab in Manchester. UCubed is a great new event in Manchester, England. It brings together the Debian and Ubuntu communities to share ideas and knowledge. We'll be hosting talks and workshops on various topics such as Ubuntu Debian bug reporting, package management, and many more topics. Our next event will be on the 2nd of April at MadLab in Manchester. And more details can be found at our website at ucubed.info. Try it yourself. You'll see. But don't take it from us. Excellent. Well, please make sure, if you can do, go along and support that event, um, run by John Spriggs and a number of other people who listen to this show. Um, so, yeah, worth supporting. Uh, the, was, sorry, sorry. Go on. sorry, Mark. I'll do this one. The Ubuntu UK Loco will be holding a quiz night on Saturday the 16th of April at 9pm uh, British Summer Time, UK time. Uh, the quiz is open to all and will be held in... Hash Ubuntu Trivia, sorry, Hash Ubuntu Dash Trivia. I assume that's on the Freenode network. It is, yes. Excellent. So there's basically a bot in there and it asks you trivia questions. And they're all about the, at the moment, it asks you loads of random trivia questions. But on the night, it will be Ubuntu related questions written by uh, some people that Alan Bell organized to write questions or something. <laughs> some people, Alan Bell. And uh, I think he's also organizing a mumble server. So if you've got a headset, a uh, microphone, oh. and that kind of stuff, so you can chat in the background you actually do the quiz online in the typing channel but you chat in the background about you know who got the right answer and stuff brilliant and ken fallon friend of the show sent us this promo for the hacker public radio hi hpr listeners this is pokey's mom you can now record hpr episodes from your phone dial 206 312 Five seven four nine for USA, and for the UK, dial two zero three four three two five eight seven nine. Record your story and hit pound when finished. And just to let you know, if I can call in a show, so can all of y'all. And for Mr. Agro, stop picking on my son in IRC, or I'm calling my mother. I'm going to get my mum to leave messages. <laughs> I'm, I'm intimidated enough already by that. Stop picking on my son. Excellent. Okay, and that's all the events we've got this time.
there's been a bug reported in uh, Ubuntu, and uh, if you're interested in looking it up, it's uh, on Launchpad, and it's bug number 723831. Now, the interesting point about this bug, we get bugs right all the time, but the interesting point about this bug is the request has been made to change uh, part of the installer, um, the Ubuntu installer. Now, for a little while, we've had a little tick box that's allowed you to, during the installer, install some non-free components. You just tick the box. Okay. And if you tick the box, you get some non-free stuff like Flash, Codex, that kind of thing. Right. And the bug request is asking for that to be turned on by default. Oh. How's that a bug? Well, it, we use the bug to track changes like this. Okay. So rather than just do it under the covers, you know, like, I don't know, moving the buttons from the right to the left, <laughs> file a bug and get someone to do it. And then it's all, you know, kind of out in the open. Okay. Um, I thought the idea was that you changed it under the covers, then people file bugs about the change. We could do that too. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. works as well, doesn't it? But the fact is the bug's already there now. So now we know about it. Mm. Okay. Now right. there's, there's been some discussion on the bug about um, the... Um, implication of changing this and there's there's a couple of you know issues relating to this one is legally whether we can ship with that button ticked mm, that's a good point actually. okay and the other one is morally whether we should ship <laughs> with that button ticked i should imagine there are a few people getting quite excited about this uh you'd be surprised i think it's kind of under the radar at the moment there's only a few people subscribed to the bug um and it's only been discussed by mostly canonical people Oh, right, uh, okay. So Jono's uh, uh, weighed in and Paul Sladen has uh, added his 2P. Okay. Um, so, yeah, there's a few people from Canonical on there, but um, it doesn't seem to have had much in the way of community discussion. So what are the arguments for doing it then? Um, well, uh, the main argument is I've installed Ubuntu and YouTube doesn't work. Right. Um, because they haven't got Flash. Because they don't have Flash. Um, so the, it's to improve the out-of-the-box experience. So take, for example, yeah. Linux Mint, where they do ship loads of stuff out of the box. Yeah. And that seems to be quite popular with users. Okay. People quite like the fact that they can chuck a CD in, install their system, walk away, and know that everything's installed ready for the user. But you can still install that stuff with Ubuntu through the software center, can't you? You can, but it's a bit obscure. You have to, you know, if you wanted it all, there's a package uh, which... Uh, is a meta package which links to a yeah. bunch of other stuff like Flash, Codex, fonts, and all kind of stuff. And you could go looking for that, but why not just tick a box? Or why not just have the box ticked? I mean, the box in the installer, if it's there and you can choose to select it if you know what it does, um, it fine. gives you a little bit of text. There's a little description right. underneath it that says what it does. Yeah. So people positively choose to install that stuff. Yeah, I do. Every yeah. time I install, because I know full well I'm going to want Flash and I'm going to want to play MP3. Okay. Yeah. So if so, what's the problem with people doing that? Ticking the box? Are, are we worried about people wearing out the left mouse button? Are we worried about their fingers? You know. Well, it's more that people don't realise. You know what people are like. They don't read stuff that's on the screen. So they chuck the CD in, run the installer... And they don't tick the box because they don't know what it means. So they just go next, 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 finish. You okay. know, we've, we've made the installer so much nicer now that there's, there's very few dialogues that you have to actually actively go and punch. It's mostly automatic. Okay. So the default, that, sorry, the option to make the default that it's turned on is presumably easier for people, but it gives people non-free software. By default. By default. So they could opt out still. They could, yeah. They could still choose... Oh, actually, that looks really dangerous. No, I'm going to turn that off. I don't want Flash on my system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm only running a, a, um, one of those low-power things. What am I thinking of? The CPUs, begin with A. Atom? Arm. Arm, that's the one. Yeah, I'm only running an arm. I can't get Flash on that. Um, so uh, are people saying that this is an, uh, it, it's not helping... Well, we're talking about Richard Storm. Is it, are people sort of saying that it helps people to use free uh, non-free software by default? By having this turned on by yes. default. So arguably... We're not educating people. Uh, well, arguably, we're making it worse because right. we're, we're going further down the road of proprietariness. Hey, why don't we just install Skype? Why don't we just install... Um, <laughs> yeah, big thumbs up from Laura. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why don't we go around and install Oracle? You know, what, what's stopping us installing all this other non-free software? What, why limit it just to Flash and MP3? Because they're what everybody else uses on an everyday-to-day -day basis. And we're, getting, we're catering for new and new users who use these as standard. So 
we want new users to be able to use our system and they don't want to have to go install drivers. They don't want to have to do those things. So have it on by default means we have more of a chance of getting new users to use it. But don't we also want new users to use free software? And surely Some, some of us do. <laughs> <laughs> well, if that's a no, that's a no. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's founded on... There There are some, you know, we do have a... Like, <laughs> A principle that we only ship free software. Yeah, you know the whole the whole premise of Ubuntu is everything you get is free, and you shouldn't be put in a morally or legal tricky situation by yeah. accepting a CD from us. Mm. Does the legal thing really override the moral thing? Well, they're, they're both. They're, it's parallel arguments, isn't it? Yeah. You've, you've you've really got to accept both of them. And the legal side of it, as I understand it, has gone to Canonical's legal department for them to figure out whether we can actually ship this stuff out of the box. Right. I mean, that would obviously, you know, undercut a lot of the argument if they said, no, no way, not not worth it from a legal point of view. Sure, but the fact is it has been proposed, and it's yeah. been proposed by someone who works for Canonical. So the chances are this has been discussed inside Canonical. Sure. This wasn't a community discussion. However, mm. now that it's a bug report, it can be a community discussion. Right, Okay. Whether that actually changes things or not, I don't know. You'll know if you if you follow the bug, you'll notice that actually someone changed the description to make it more descriptive, and that actually got reverted by the guy who filed the bug. So, right. are they wanting discussion, <laughs> or do they just want to say, "Look, we're doing things in the open, like you've been complaining we haven't"? Exactly. Are they just Ooh. ticking the box to say, "Look, we filed a bug for it. We went through the process. This is the process you want for open development." Mm, you think it could be just be yeah, what, what redress service. do you have back on a bug that you know those kind of things happen you don't have any redress well um there's certainly the possibility for the community to comment on it and once it's more widely known you know then people will start um i don't know telling canonical that actually that might not be a good thing to have that tick by default or might be a good thing i don't know i'm i'm in two minds about it yeah i think it's a good thing to have the box there but I don't think it's necessarily the right thing to have it checked by default. See, I'd be kind of leaning towards it being checked by default. What, what's, the, what's the key benefit of having it ticked by default, really? Really for more having new users so that you don't have to sit down with them and tick it for them because chances are you're going to get a phone call or an email after going, this isn't working, this isn't working. Do new users actually go through the installer themselves or don't they get their local geek yeah, to I do would, it for I them? Wouldn't, I wouldn't let a new user install it themselves if i was going to be the one who was going to be their go-to guy if it broke i would sit there and make sure it was set up right in the first place so Which why not mean... just leave it on by default well it, well because exactly <laughs> well no you, your point was that the new user should have uh the 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 new user experience should be you know great for them out the box yep but that user isn't going to be that, that new user won't be going through the installer, so it's largely irrelevant whether that tick box is ticked or not because the new user isn't is never going to see it. Because new users, in my experience, either get their box with an OS pre installed, brand new users, or yeah. a geek does it for them, in which case it's pre installed. Yeah, in, in the RSC channel, hash Ubuntu UK podcast on Freenode, Phil T points out that Windows doesn't come with Flash and all these uh, mm-hmm. other goodies. It doesn't come with, with uh, MPEG 2 playback by, by, by default and that sort of thing. Uh-huh. Although uh, I think Dr. Force has pointed out that generally the OEMs yeah. who manufacture the laptops or whatever, you're buying, bundle all of that stuff in there with it. And a um, whole load of other rubbish. <laughs> yes, <laughs> a whole load of other stuff they don't need. Um, but so effectively, they do get it with the machine. That um, is one thing that does concern me about the the prospect. It's like you were saying, if they're going to have, you know, a few things in there by default, why not just have one more thing? Why not just have one more thing? And then we might end up with a default install, which is full of a load of rubbish, which we don't really want. AOL installers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and things like Codex, I can understand there's a good practical reason people are going to come across uh, media in these formats that they should be able to play. And until there's a, a really good free software alternative to Flash that actually works consistently with all of the different sites out there, it, the pragmatic approach is to install Flash. Yeah. Um, but things like Skype, obviously, it's got first a massive sort of kind of first user advantage, first mover advantage. But you know, there are uh, open source VoIP clients. In fact, there is one shipped in Ubuntu by default. Is there? Um, the uh, empathy. Key, uh, yeah, sorry. I don't uh, think we ship a Kiga anymore. Is it? Oh, okay. Em- I- empathy, I think, does voice and video if you add bits. Okay. Am I like Ubuntu 710 here or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, who remembers those days? Um, yeah, so the, the, but there are some alternatives for some of them, which it would be nice to prefer if they are viable alternatives, in my mind. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at what it, has, what it is that it actually gets installed. Now, I had a poke at the source code for Ubiquity because I wasn't actually sure what that tick box did. And there's actually a package called Ubuntu Restricted Add-ons. Okay. And there's Kubuntu Restricted Add-ons and Zubuntu Restricted Add-ons for the various flavors. Right. And the Ubuntu Restricted Add-ons adds Flash, um, some GStreamer stuff, including MP3 playback only. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, another plugin that allows you to load uh, QuickTime and Microsoft DLLs to playback video. So that would be useful if, for example, you're playing back a streaming uh, video site yep. and you need to add DLLs, the libraries that allow the video de decompression to happen. Yep. Um, there's also Firewire uh, included in there, uh, Firewire-like protocols, whatever they are. DVD navigation and playback. Yes. That's pretty fundamental, yep. you know. Um and Dirac codec and VP8, the, the codec from Google. Mm -hmm. That's all in that add-ons. Now, that's there's another one called Ubuntu Restricted Extras, which is actually what most people, most Ubuntu geeks tell people to install. Okay. Which actually installs the one that I just said, plus a bunch of other stuff. And the bunch of other stuff it includes is a bunch of other codecs, like M Motion JPEG stuff, AAC encoding, and X264 encoding. Now, the key thing about those two is those are useful if you want to encode stuff for things like iPad, iPhone, um, iPod, and also other phones. Yeah, hmm. Other phones are available. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the key thing Not is in your they're... house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the key thing is they're encoders. Yes. So if you're doing stuff like with... We ship a video and it's a pity. Yes. And by default, it, we ship it broken effectively yeah. because you can't use it to put video on lots of common household devices that you would want to play on. Yeah. And so does it make sense to actually add all this stuff? Oh, and there's also Microsoft Codex and UNRAR in that uh, Ubuntu Street. Yeah. Street. Oh, wow. Well, Unra. Can't live without that. Yeah. <laughs> well, some people can't. You know. So how many of these things are closed source and how many of them are perhaps patent incumbent? Because, I mean, a lot of things I can see there. Like, I mean, I assume MP3 encoding, isn't that just lame, which is open source? Isn't the, it? Well, I think it's the GStreamer version. It's the GStreamer one, right. which is slightly different from lame. So I think all the GStream, GStreamer stuff is open source, yeah. as in the licensing, but it is the patent issue that stops it being in, in there by default. Which isn't a problem in the UK anyway. Which shouldn't be a problem shouldn't in the UK. Be a problem in the UK. But we only ship one C D. We do only ship one yeah. C D. That's the problem. Yeah, right. <laughs> so that, and that's why it has to go to legal because you know, wherever you are in the world, you know, someone could you know, we could send a whole batch of CDs to, yeah. to some loco team in, you know, wherever they are with a restrictive um, you know, patent law. Yeah. USA, perhaps, I guess. Yeah. And they get, you know, slapped with some kind of notice for, you know, not using them. And then you've got things like the Codex, which are about redistribution license. Uh, sorry, the, the things like um, Flash and uh, Unra, which are redistribution and licensing issues rather than um, uh, patents yeah. directly affecting the software itself. Yeah. So it is a bit of a mixture. And I think that's one of the things that's difficult for people to tell is why would it be a potential problem for me to install this? Exactly. And why is it? And one of the questions that I often get asked or I get told, Mint is better than Ubuntu because it ships this stuff. That's, you know, there's three reasons yeah. why Mint is better than Ubuntu, I was told, this okay. week. Right. <laughs> One, it has a better visual design. Mm -hmm. Two, it um, has some extra tools that we don't have yet, but we're starting to get. Okay. Um, and three, it ships all this stuff by default. So those three things together, for an end user, you know, they're pretty compelling. Do Mint just turn a blind eye to the potential issues about distributing this stuff internationally then? I, I don't know how they do it. I don't know whether they have mirrors in various places or they just you know ignore it or whether they have a script that runs after you've done the install that goes and gets it auto magically yeah i'm not sure but the fact is lots of people cite mint as better than ubuntu because of this exact feature i mean it is the logical conclusion to the journey we've been on where first of all you had to apt get stuff from the command line to install all these extra codecs and then you had a pop-up no, you had to w get and compile <laughs> and, make, <laughs> and make install back in the day um but you know, then then you whacked a, an mp3 onto your system and clicked it and there was a little dialogue box came up mm -hmm. and it went off and got the right codecs for you now it's all available as a as a, a install time uh, option yeah and 
is the next logical step for that 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 is then either just installed by default or you know it's installed under the covers maybe yeah and the next option is you just put the cd in and it installs and you don't even get any questions yeah exactly that isn't thing? that isn't that the gnome ideal you know well, that's just, the windows it, way isn't it yeah windows KDE ideal it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't really ask you an awful lot it's just where do you want to put it right done Right, okay. Well, if you've got any thoughts on um, the free software uh, in Ubuntu by default debate, I can't think of a snappier title for, for it than that off the top of my oh, head. I can. Go uh, on, then. Bug 723831. <laughs> that rolls off the tongue. Yeah. Yeah, you're working from a different definition of snappy than me. Um, okay, but if you've got any feedback, uh, send it to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. Or leave a comment in the show notes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Welcome to the Bit About Ubuntu. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, Mark Shuttleworth has been on a bit of a blogging spree with articles de- detailing the new scroll bars for Unity and the name of the release to come after Natty. Oh. Yeah, okay, you're going to have to say it. What's it called? Oh, Narek Ocelot. Yeah. It's not a bad attempt. Easy okay. to say my surname. Onerick. Onerick. <laughs> Onerick. Uh, uh, well, I, I, on dictionary.com, the American little snippet woman says Oneric. Oneric. Oh. Oneric. Oh, right, okay. What does it mean? Oh, no. It means dreamy or dreamlike or in a dream or something like okay. that. Okay. And an ocelot is? A cat. Right. Dreamlike cat is a lot easier to say. They're trying to, to steal all of the cats before Apple gets to use them. That's what <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Dreamy cat. Yeah. I think we should call it dreamy cat. <laughs> <That's the laughs> or name. just double O. Yeah. So, so Mark's not got anything better to do with his time than to blog about scroll bars. They're quite, I think he has I, quite I a like lot better bars. to do with his time. <laughs> okay. I like the scroll bars. Okay. I think they're a good idea. Can you explain what the difference is? Right. Well, you know how on, say, um, a, m- a mobile browser, when you're scrolling, yeah. you don't actually have a full fat scroll bar on the side. You just sort of, you okay. start scrolling and it sort of has a little slither down the side. Yeah. And as you scroll up and down, you probably don't on your phone, Tony, but <laughs> Alan will know what I'm talking Meow. about. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're right, I don't. <laughs> basically, um what they're looking at doing in Unity is having all of the programs have that as the scroll bars, except when you go to mouse over them, they'll have a little handle pop up, like mm-hmm. the handle you have at the moment, which you can then drag up and down. So it has the same right. functionality as the current scroll bars. They just look, uh, they keep out of your way, basically. It takes up less real estate. I yes, guess. exactly. And if you're using um, a touch screen, for instance, you won't even get the handle because you won't need to because you can just stick your hand on my offering I do, I do love how they um, whenever you mention to the canonical design people that this sounds like it's designed for touch they always say no and yet it's quite obviously this is you know going in the you know big buttons on the left hand side yeah. that you can easily aim for and stab um, window controls that you can grab hold of and you know slide the windows in and out nice easy mm. and a scroll bar that highlights when you put your finger over it you you'd know. swear it was being designed on an iPad yeah <laughs> <clears throat> moving on. Hey, moving on. Mark. <laughs> um, jo- is that Lee or Leah? No, it's the next one. No, next one. Okay. Sorry. The Ubuntu Wiki is about to be relicensed under Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license, replacing the existing state where all the edits were owned by Canonical. Oh, all your edits are belong to us. Yeah, this was a, a bit of a mistake, really. Oh. Well, when you think about it, you know, people editing a community wiki. And then Canonical own all of that. Yeah, that, that's, that's not quite right. right. That's not right. Okay. Um, so there was a, it was an automatic transfer of copyright, was it? Uh, yeah, uh, no. Was it a bit uh, of a it's, gray sti- area? it's still in discussion at the moment. Okay. Um, we put out a notification to say we're going to relicense it as Creative Commons, and we actually extracted all the email addresses of 15,000 people who've contributed to the wiki over the five years that it's existed, or however long it is, okay. and spammed them all with a message <laughs> to say, we're going to change the um, license of the wiki from copyright canonical to Creative Commons um, share alike 3.0. I think I edited it once. I don't remember getting the email. Uh, really? Maybe it's still coming through. Yeah, it might be yeah. stuck. Stuck in my spam filter. Is it in your phone? Is yeah, that that's where it is. Yeah, yeah. so I keep all my email. Well, it sounds like a, good, a step in the right direction and good move then, really. Yeah, we've had some comments uh, about, um, you know, objecting to the fact that we're doing it en masse without actually uh, individually asking each person to say yes. 
um, that, that they are allowed, you know, they're going to allow us to reassign. Yeah. Um, but that's been very few and far between. Most people have just said, yep, great, fantastic. But um, then again, if Canonical have owned any everything so far anyway, yeah. you don't actually have to ask them. True. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Which is what makes, you know, this actually going beyond what they really yeah. have to do legally. Yeah, fair enough. The Ubuntu Maryland Loco leader has stepped down and others are also voicing concern and switching away from Ubuntu. Yes. Yes, this is... A, there's a thing in the Ubuntu Code of Conduct, isn't there, about sort of stepping down gracefully and mm-hmm. not um, being difficult when you do so. And I don't think he was being particularly difficult, but no, he was certainly uh, uh, made a bit of noise about it. He didn't just sort of decide to step down I think quietly. a few people... Well, otherwise, you know, if you just, if you just decide to... You know, remove your blog from Planet Ubuntu yeah. and shy away. You know, you tell a few people that I'm stepping down. Um, I'll hand over all my projects to you people, and then you step down quietly. Then maybe nobody realizes that there's actually a problem. Yeah, mm. and what these people are doing is voicing their concern because they believe there is an issue with the way the Ubuntu project is going. Yes, and his reason were actually we're part of the reason he left. Uh, oh, excellent, left Ubuntu. Well, kind of. <laughs> In the, one of the turning points for him was when we um, interviewed uh, Ivanka Magic. Um, about the design philosophies uh, of Ubuntu. And um, uh, he was disappointed but, uh, with some of the things she said about, you know, um, denying that it tried, that Ubuntu was trying to look like Mac OS. Well. Right. Um, so, yeah, we've got a nice name check in that. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, okay. Every cloud. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, it's... Uh, He's it, not the only one. There's no. a few people who've left, and um, I don't think that was, like, the main reason. I, I realise no, he's no. just one guy, but the fact is these are people in leadership positions within the, within the Ubuntu project who are looking to leave because it's not going the right way. Yeah, they're probably disillusioned, really. And I suppose it's going to happen to a percentage of people, but it's, it's disheartening when somebody who's been contributing for a long time starts to feel that way. Yeah. Never a stranger to stirring up the UI pot, Matthew Paul Thomas has written at length about the redundancy of the quit option in applications. The post has sparked some discussion, with many users taking sides very quickly in the discussion that followed. Yes, he posted a blog titled We Quit or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I think a few people took that to mean the design team are quitting. Yeah, going to work at Apple, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's only because we were just talking about I know, it. I know, I know, I know. I got it. That's good, that's good. Yeah. But yeah, it was um, it was it was an interesting post. But I mean, I I kind of, as I read through it, I kept changing my mind about what he was trying to say. Whether he was trying to say that we don't need a quit option because we shouldn't quit applications, or we do need to quit option. We do need uh, we do need to quit applications. We just don't need to say that we're doing it explicitly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you close the last tab in your browser. Yeah why doesn't the browser close you know yeah in fact on os 10 you close all the tabs you're left with chrome running yes it's, it's still there oh. you know your browser is still running eating up ram if you do does it still have an um, address bar yes you can no, you can close your in, every window every tab yeah. that you have open but it will still occupy the window and the icon will still be lit up because it's it it's open your application is right. still eating resources I had a Windows PDA that did that uh, at a place I worked once. They gave it you, to me. You have and great phones, don't you? <laughs> I do. And it was great because you, if you launched more than two applications, you soon got an out-of-memory message. And I right. worry that for small portable devices and things like that, we'll get to a point where large applications like browsers that use up a lot of RAM um, will start to see this sort of, you must close X and Y application before you can continue to but, launch a new application. But then, you see, one of, the, one of my favorite PDA devices was the Palm. And the Palm, you yeah. didn't quit. You you press the Home button to take you back to the list of all the applications, and you stab the application you want to run. And when you finish, you press Home, and you go to another application. There was no concept ever of quitting an application. You you were running one thing, then you ran something else. You ran the network stack that got you dialed in somewhere, then you pressed Home and went to something else. And that that works well. Whereas yeah. you look at some, I look at my coworkers using an iPhone. And they press the double tap, hold something down, and then they go through closing every app that they have open, sitting there pressing the little minus sign on everything. I think, what on earth are you doing? And they say, oh, I'm closing it all to save resources. And like, they have no visibility. It doesn't, by default, give you any visibility mm. of the resources like we do with Ubuntu with the system manager. But they still feel compelled. There's something inside people that makes them still want to press a close this now because I say so button. I guess if we could be sure that the hardware 
was sufficiently powerful and that there wasn't going to be a, uh, a negative effect on the battery life of these things, then yeah, you know, if there was enough RAM to cope with pretty much everything you wanted to run between reboots once a month, say, you know, when you power the thing down or whatever it might mm-hmm. be, fine. You know, the Palm model would work, but I suspect that modern applications don't behave that well. I found on my Android phone, which seems to do this, you just hit the home button and the application is still running. Sometimes, sometimes when you go back to the application, it starts again. It seems to depend on which application. But in general, I haven't found that to be a problem with my phone running out of resources. But on my desktop, particularly my desktop at work, where I'm doing a lot of development and I have things like a um, Java-based IDE Ah. running and a few other applications running alongside that, I soon find that... I have to say, right, I don't want that open anymore. I don't want that open anymore mm. uh, because I need to free up the resources to do other things. Mm. Yeah, if you get to the stage you need 8 gig in your you know, desktop. Your just phone. To, just to run <laughs> in my phone, yeah. Yeah, my, my, my money takes 8 gig in an SD card slot. Jerry Carr from Canonical Marketing has posted that Ubuntu Netbook Edition as a name is no more. Uh, along with Ubuntu Desktop and starting with 11.04, both will simply be known as Ubuntu. I think this is a good move. Makes sense. Yes. Makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, good. Do we agree about that? Don't we all agree? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You haven't got. You still have an Ubuntu server, so you'll have Ubuntu server, and mm-hmm. you'll have Ubuntu. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that's suitable for laptops, desktops, netbooks, phones, phones iPads, whatever. Everything that isn't a server. Right. Cool. Apparently, you run servers on your desktop, don't you? How does that work? No, don't go down there. <laughs> Alan, I see you've put an entry in here with a complicated title. Can you tell us, tell us what it is, please? Canoninomity app indicator gate. Uh, easy for you to say. Yes, I did practice a few times. So basically, there's been a lot of blogging going on. Yes, an awful lot of blogging. Mm. More so than usual? Yes. Mostly between members of the Canonical uh, and uh, Ubuntu leadership and the GNOME leadership. KDE? A little bit. A little, yeah, little bit yeah. chipping in. Yeah. Towards the end. Aaron Saigo, yes. Don't want to feel left out. <laughs> <laughs> what, have you been, what have they been blogging about? Um, the way in which Canonical and Ubuntu work together, basically, or the Ubuntu project and GNOME work together. Okay. And it's really long and drawn out, and there's a bazillion blog posts about this, going through the absolute minutest detail of the whole process of how one particular bit of Ubuntu did or didn't get submitted to GNOME and did or didn't get rejected and thus does or doesn't make Canonical a contributor to GNOME. (laughs) It seems that the tensions between the GNOME and Ubuntu communities, if you like, have been escalating over the last couple of months. Um, Yeah, it's kind of got worse since Unity was announced, really. (laughs) The whole thing about not using GNOME Shell, using Unity, the whole thing about taking away the um, commission from music sales through Banshee... um, yeah, and a few other sort of you know bad tempered remarks of, of sort of being flying backwards and forwards. Really, it's, it's more like the uh, Ubuntu Debian relationship used to be. Yeah, um, that's sort of mm. the same sort of tension, yeah. really, which is a bit disappointing. It is, and it does feel like these people should just get in a room together because it's it's just not right having all of this dragged up over and over and over again. In part, okay, partly it is right because everyone needs to know about it, but it's just I don't know. But it's part mm. of it that it's not fully open as well. It's not fully public. We don't know what was said in the bug reports or patches or behind closed doors or on IRC or on private mailing lists. We do now if you read all the prompt posts. No, but they still refer, <laughs> they st- that's just it. That they still refer and allude to bug reports or they allude to a conversation oh, right. that happened on a mailing list or in person over a drink or, you know, if you have it on a, an open summit or an open forum or even like an IRC meeting where everybody can jump in and take part, it's logged, you can see it, mm-hmm. which is why mm-hmm. we log our channels. Mm. Fair enough. Right, well, that's all in the bit about Ubuntu, but... We also have a not about Ubuntu. Yeah. The exciting new segment. What's in our not about Ubuntu, Alan? All new button gate. More button saga. Yes. Okay. <laughs> this time it's not us. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> Who's buttoning today, then? Um, it's Gnome, isn't it? Gnome Shell. Oh, priceless. Oh, yeah, they want to get rid of more buttons. Yes. It's not just moving them around, it's just getting rid of the buttons. Yes. We've moved them, they're chopping them. So, yes, excellent blog post. We'll put a link in the uh, in the titles. It, it's called, Where Did the Buttons Go? Yeah, we don't need maximise and minimise and stuff. No. Yeah. I've Fair already enough. removed them from my KDE windows. 
No point. No, don't need them. Don't use them. Were they not shiny enough? Well, you don't use what? Minimize and maximize buttons? I, I use maximize by double-clicking the title bar. I never use minimize because I have six virtual desktops. Right. And you just leave everything open full... Full screen. More That's or less. why you need to close I never, applications. I never overlap things. I just have different virtual desktops. With big, full-size full, C, full size stuff open. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe they have a point. Fair enough. OpenSUSE have made a, a new release, 11.4. There's stuff in it. Yeah. Latest version of... Well, not, they haven't got GNOME 3 in it. They were hoping to have GNOME 3 in it, but they're stuck with the older version of GNOME. But Although, they use the latest KDE? Yeah, KDE is their primary desktop anyway. So that it's, oh, is it? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Um, so the fact that the latest GNOME isn't in it isn't that big a deal. But right. it is a, an install option, I believe. You can select to use GNOME. By default, they use KDE. Mm-hmm. And it looks quite shiny from the screenshots. So yep. if you're interested, check that out. And lastly, um, some people have been complaining about the rather um, silly names we give um, Ubuntu sometimes, the yeah. release names. So we have Oh Really Owl or whatever it is this time around. And uh, <laughs> the Fedora community have taken this, this uh, baton up and uh, somebody has suggested that they call their next release, <laughs> Fedora 16, Beefy Miracle. Yes. With and the so, most tenuous justification ever. Yeah, they've got an even more tenuous naming scheme than we have, so I don't think they can... Well, uh, ours is just Mark Decides. Well, yes, but it's, <laughs> it's alphabetical. Yeah, oh, okay. okay. Yeah, there is a system. Yeah. There's and an animal. It's a something an animal. animal. Right. Whereas there's, uh, there's a, a link. There is a link between each name, but the link is different each time. Yes. And the so, link has, Yes, okay. And the link this time is something like each name is a string which, when a function is applied to it, returns a certain number. So the current the current name is Lovelock, and when you apply this algorithm to the word Lovelock, and you apply the same algorithm to Beefy Miracle, they return the same result. Therefore, they are linked. Yes. In that way. Yes. I think they should do it. I think it's great. Somebody set up Beefy Miracle on Twitter, I believe. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I like the logo. It's a hot dog guy with a with a mustard like, yeah. slightly under. I quite like it. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> but then I quite like Lovelock. I quite like Lovelock as a name. I think that's quite a good name. Okay. But what do I know? There we go. Well, that's all in the not about and bit about Ubuntu this time. Right. We've got a lot of feedback this week, so it okay. looks like it looks like we were missed. First up, <laughs> or not. <laughs> uh, first up, our, our first command line love of the new year. Uh, Joe Pitt Francis emailed us and Nathaniel wrote on our Facebook page to say they didn't like it much, mainly because... All it generates are dictionary words, which is the number one thing they tell you not to use when generating a password. He's totally right. <clears throat> yes. And uh, Alan apparently pointed this out in the uh, in the show, although none of us can actually remember him doing it. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, we got a fair bit of a, of a shoeing, I think, an old-fashioned shoeing for this. Um, yeah. Maybe you, you could use a dictionary word as a basis for and then do your own transformation. Yeah, keep digging. <laughs> yeah. Probably best not to use dictionary words. Although, to be fair, the command did actually cut out things that were less than eight characters in length. So, yeah. you know, you couldn't have chosen cat or dog mm-hmm. yeah, as your password. There we go. <clears throat> Moving on. Grant Stone emailed from New Zealand about where to securely store passwords once you have them. I heartily recommend KeePass. It, opens, it works on open source, Windows, Mac, and of course Linux. KeePass. KeePass. Oh, there we Keep go. KeePass. K-E-E-P-A-S-S. Oh. Yes. Yeah. It's like a password store thing. Oh, Grant, I guess. Actually, it. Yeah, it came, it came up um, after I mentioned, I think, that my... Yeah, account got a lot. Um, yes. Yes, I had to change yes. all my passwords, basically. You did. Yes. But I use one called LastPass. I use LastPass as well. It's brilliant. It's really good. All oh, yeah. right, okay. Yeah. I use Revelation, which is also in Ubuntu, yeah. and it's quite good. Next, our discussion on leading the way with open source innovation. Simon Reap emailed and Matt Bailey tweeted to inform us of our mistake in attributing tabbed browsing to Firefox. Unfortunately, Opera and other proprietary software brought us tabs before Mozilla Suite and Firefox did. Yep, a fair point, um, and I think we realised that just as we were finishing recording. We saw <laughs> yes. the feedback in the IRC channel, so um, yeah. Tom Such posted on our website. There are some aspects of the desktop Linux experience that are definitely innovative and have been picked up by Apple and Microsoft. I don't just mean the comp is eye candy, but genuinely useful stuff like multiple virtual desktops and package managers like app stores. Yeah, everyone's doing that now. Yeah, wasn't the Apple kind of 
eye candy stuff coming out about the same time as the Compiz stuff. I know they didn't have the Cube, but they had the sort of uh, mm. expose mm-hmm. desktop thing, didn't they? Yeah. I think it was kind of fairly concurrent, if mm. I remember. Yep. Fair enough. Uh, you can be more in this discussion to which Mark Hartley contributed in his comment section on episode one of our website. And that's Mark me, not Mark Shuttleworth. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Before you get too excited. <laughs> Stuart po- posted on our website to point out that Supercomputers almost exclusively run Linux. Internet servers are more often than not Linux-based, and the software for managing and serving the web is dominated by open source. Also, don't forget that the open source Android has the largest market share, and Symbian has the largest installation base of any operating system in the world at over 2 billion phones. Right. Yeah, fair okay. point. Yeah, but... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Symbian does, <laughs> Symbian does now. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't. Soon it will it be Windows Phone. It, Symbian wasn't free software no, yeah, when it, it got that market that's, share. Yeah. That's fair. Android point. isn't 100% free software. Yes. And, and, okay. And it's it Linux, requires, which is good. But yeah. yeah. And it requires Google to have all your data, which isn't ideal. Yeah. Is there anything in Android that's particularly innovative, though, or is it really an open source clone of the iPhone? It depends question. who you ask. I mean, the integration yeah. with Google services is innovative in a word yeah, yeah having having your stuff up in the cloud is is yeah. very useful being able to like log on to a gmail web browser on my pc and maintain all my contact details and know that that will sync down to my phone magically and i don't have to think about it yeah mm-hmm. is really nice yeah. but then you can do that on most phones now they True. led the way sure yeah nigel verity emailed to reassure us that all science and art builds upon what has gone before you wouldn't for example say that bob marley's music was pointless just because he didn't invent reggae that's a fair point yeah Yep, we stand on the shoulders of giants and all that sort of stuff. Ask Ubuntu user Alan from Scotland popped into the IRC channel to tell us. A few of us at askubuntu.com have put together a site which we'd like mentioned on the programme if it's possible. The website is ourfriendsinjapan.com and is a show of moral support. It's completely grassroots with no connection to Canonical, just a message for the community by the community. That's a really nice idea. Hmm. Obviously Japan has been... Having a tough time of it over the last few days, and uh, there are obviously Ubuntu people out there as well. Um, mm. So, yeah, it's nice to think about them at this point. Yeah. And obviously, we wish any of our listeners who are in Japan or that part of the world were affected by it all the best, and uh, hopefully, uh, things, will improve. things will improve soon. And finally, on a completely different subject, uh, Lorenzo Sutton emailed us from Italy to share his thoughts on public funded bodies and openness. The British Library's virtual book's website, and I'm going to include the URL in the show notes, is heavily Silverlight dependent. Initially, the national broadcaster RAI, like the BBC, um, uses super close Silverlight for their online TV thing. Okay, there is Moonlight, but it crashes heavily, etc. So I think um, so. I think public funded bodies, like the British Library, should go towards openness and not towards agreements with Microsoft. It seems like there were some other rumours about the BL and Microsoft deals. Yeah, it's unfortunate that, you know, we're putting our data in the hands of, you know, Microsoft, really, yeah. with these with these formats. And this isn't the first time. And But one of the things that the current coalition government in the UK is talking about is, you know, using open standards and um, because they see it's a cheaper way to do business. So mm. it's a shame in, in a way that the British Library is a hugely public funded body is, is going down this other way, aren't yeah. listening. Indeed. Right. And that's the end of your feedback. <laughs> That's all for this episode. (laughs) (laughs) Knew that cider was a bad move. It was all going so well, though. I was doing so well. That's all for this episode. Thank you for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail numbers and Twitter feeds, Facebook and IRC channels. Let us know what you think of the show or give us your thoughts of Ubuntu and the community about it. (sighs) Thank you, Laura. Yeah, Yeah. thank you, Laura, for coming along. Have you enjoyed yourself? Yeah, not too bad. Bit of fun. Yeah. (laughs) And I didn't swear. Yeah, you, you didn't. <laughs> and if you weren't listening live, you'll never know what that was about. <laughs> the advantages to listening live. We're going to be back in two weeks on the 29th of March for the next episode. So join us live or download from the website the day afterwards. Don't join me because I'll be at Open Source Junction. Yeah, okay. Well, join us next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.